in the context of patronates. So please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, a lot of thanks for the kind invitation and the opportunity to talk here. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it will be a question of uh, physics, but I am not a physicist and I'm afraid I might disappoint you, but we will see about that later. Uh, the, the idea of this talk is to uh, show you uh, why it is that uh, uh, many researchers, including myself, uh, uh, love to work with the petri nets and uh, in the particular and the particular aspect of, of uh, concurrency uh, that, uh, that can be expressed in them. And uh, the, the uh, main thesis that uh, I try to convince you of is that uh, these, uh, this model and uh, this uh, phenomenon are still fertile today and uh, transcend the boundaries of, uh, of scientific discipline. So I will uh, start with, uh, with an informal uh, introduction to uh, how veterinets work, famous token game. Then, uh, following a kind of a brief to a tiny little extent, I will actually talk about uh, some connections with physics. And then uh, show some uh, uh, applications in engineering context, so in particular in uh, the context of uh, uh, telecommunication networks, and uh, a, in the last part, the uh, relatively recent uh, impact of, that the model uh, uh, has started to have in, uh, in biology, so we are coming to, uh, to life sciences. So uh, when uh, when he usually goes uh, goes back uh, when discussing about petronets uh, to the uh, doctoral thesis of Carpada uh, and Petri, he sees uh, four years ago uh, that was uh, submitted in uh, 1961 and uh, defended in 1962, uh, which actually talks about uh, um, communication with automata. Uh, so, so the uh, real uh, issue here was not so much defending the uh, the net model um, that was uh, in his mind uh, well before that, but really uh, to see how uh, entities interact and uh, how the entities uh, interacting span on physical processes and how you can understand these. Uh, if you haven't seen a Petronet, well, it is, uh, it is not, much of a, not much of a secret. Like I said in the announcement, we work on cycles and boxes or uh, bars and uh, some arrows between them and you put some little uh, objects inside the places that you're done. Uh, then what is interesting is uh, how, do you, how do you interpret these? Well, the, the circles are places, positions in which uh, objects can uh, exist or where uh, conditions can hold. Uh, transitions are the boxes. They, they represent actions that are possible, events that can occur, uh, depending on the availability of resources. And uh, finally, the arrows show where tokens are consumed, where tokens are uh, produced. So right here, we are in a situation with this transition here. <laughs> is enabled because it has enough tokens in uh, the incoming uh, places and uh, will produce uh, output on this uh, place here. Um, in this model, it will be the last time in this talk, I uh, used non one weights on the, on the arcs uh, for simplicity. Uh, later on, all uh, weights on the arcs will simply be one. So right here we consumed two uh, tokens from the, from the upper place and only one from the lower because this is all the Hux asked of us. And uh, on T2 we have uh, two uh, new tokens created. So this is the, the basic uh, uh, step 
of the token game of Fetchnet. And of course, uh, these graphs are much bigger than that, and uh, actions follow one another and uh, enter in relation with one another. And this is what uh, that theory is all about. Uh, as I as I uh, said, the, the the topic of the talk is different connections, the different fields of applications that you can have uh, uh, with petri nets. So they are not just mathematical objects. Uh, it has been said that drawings like this probably uh, popped up uh, during the uh, adolescence of uh, Adam Petri when he when he was learning chemistry at school. Uh, he said to have drawn. Uh, uh, images like this to understand uh, chains of, of reaction. So here you have a, a carbon uh, oxide uh, and a chain of other uh, substances that uh, enter in a uh, in a complex reaction. And at each step, the reaction is a transition, and the substances are represented by uh, places of their presence and absence by tokens. So. Nature has played a role behind the idea of, of nets from the very beginning, and you can go a lot further than this. Um, these are uh, pictures uh, presented in uh, uh, at the Petrin Conference in China 2008 by Rudi Gafak, uh, with uh, work with uh, uh, on this. Uh, the uh, the interest in, in uh, using Petronet as, uh, as models is in the fact that uh, you have a strict locality of interactions. Um, a state is important locally, an action acts locally on, uh, on, the, uh, on its immediate physical surroundings. So, as we'll see you later, you can uh, uh, you retrieve a Phenomenon that physicists know in uh, in relativistic uh, circumstances, or basically everywhere when they account for huge uh, uh, speeds. So, uh, if you know these uh, diagrams by uh, Hamann Minkowski from the beginning of the century, uh, then you know that these cones uh, can be seen as those parts of the space in which any trajectory of, a, of, a, of an object must lie. So uh, you, can, you can move uh, from uh, bottom to top inside the red or the blue or the green uh, cone, but you cannot jump from uh, A to C directly uh, because this would be a spatial step that is uh, that would be uh, much too fast to make for any for any physical object, and so uh, at these at these points A, B, and C, uh, you have uh, different clocks in each uh, in each side that are not uh, directly synchronized with one another. So in a sense, there is no global time. There is no global clock. I said, this is developed quite a number of uh, techniques for this, and what uh, might surprise you here is that, uh, well, Minkowski geometry and so forth is uh, typically uh, uh, real geometry continuous, and petronets are inherently uh, discrete objects. They are graphs. Well, uh, this is precisely a dichotomy that. Uh, Petri has always denied. Uh, his, uh, his view is that uh, you have a model uh, that is continuous even with the finitary means of uh, Petrinets. So, just, just for an illustration, uh, a grid proposed by Petri uh, com composed of uh, transitions and uh, places as usual uh, can be used as a model for, uh, for space-time uh, and uh, you can retrieve uh, the equivalent of uh, Minkowski cones uh, in them. Well, what is unfortunate, of course, is that it moves up here and down on the right-hand side, but the principal idea is the same. Um, 
any signal can have impact only along the lines of the of the battery net, along the arcs. And uh, if you if you go horizontally, you go with quotation marks, then you move in space. Whereas uh, on top note to that, you have a, a progress of uh, of time. And what he proposes is to use uh, instead of these coordinates that are uh, foreign to the system, uh, to work with uh, coordinates that are intrinsic. In the sense that uh, you have diagonal lines uh, from left to right uh, that you can use as an x-axis and the, the others as, uh, as a y-axis. And they uh, mark the extremes of, uh, of physical connection that are, that are possible. What is interesting here is that uh, you can uh, identify uh, many things in the geometry of this, uh, this regular grid. Um, in fact, what, uh, what Petri proposes here is to uh, see uh, the grid as an unfolding of uh, regular uh, tiny structures of this shape. And conversely, to uh, uh, see um, sections of the of the grid uh, as representations of uh, um, small um, uh, Lorentz transformations in the in the space-time mm -hmm. geometry. So, what is nice here, which I will not have the time to to develop, uh, is that. Uh, the geometry is easy to draw, and uh, in physical terms, it uh, bridges the gap between uh, the very big and the very small, um, the, the global space-time um, continuum and the, uh, the smallest uh, entities of, of uh, cyclic oscillating behavior. It is uh, the uh, it is the intention of this little uh, net that you saw here, it can be interpreted as the sequence of, uh, of seasons, uh, to represent uh, a quantum oscillator uh, with uh, uh, only partial uh, observation possible, and, uh, and which is uh, the same time generator of, uh, of the global space time. I insisted already on, on uh, Petri's position that his uh, model is actually a continuous and not a discrete one. Uh, well, it can be given a, uh, uh, a topology in uh, the sense that uh, subnets that are bordered by places are open, subnets that are, placed, that are bordered by transition are closed, very much like the intervals on the real line. Uh, and uh, that it is it's not true that the, the fact of being in a place is a, um, is a discrete statement. It uh, corresponds to a uh, to the uh, to a predicate that uh, that holds true, like it holds true for an object to be in some spatial or temporal interval. And here again, um, to to uh, to show how much uh, of uh, the scientific and philosophical discussions of the 20th century actually have their reflection here. Uh, this is uh, taken from a work by, by Rudolf Kalner, um, <coughs> who uh, proposed an axiomatic uh, uh, characterization of modern physics uh, only in, in terms of relations, and uh, where it says up here, uh, a space is a class of uh, points uh, in space-time uh, that are pairwise simultaneous and uh, that share at least one point with any line uh, in the world. So that means that any uh, traversal, transversal cut that you can place across all space lines uh, correspond to, to, uh, to a space. Well, 
So just uh, to uh, to give some to give a small list of the uh, of the connections of ideas. Uh, concurrency uh, is a phenomenon that uh, is intrinsic in modern physics and therefore cannot be ignored uh, in the physical world. You never see uh, what is going on at a distant place at the same time. Of course, you can wait for signals uh, and, uh, and know something about the past. Um, and, and also, uh, you have a, an effect of concurrency uh, in the very small, uh, in quantum systems, uncertainty relations prevent you from having a global picture that is simultaneous and gives you all information about all states of the system. So, uh, Petri had a very ambitious uh, program for giving a, uh, an axiomatic theory of concurrency only in terms of uh, uh, relations. He went from binary to ternary and uh, quaternary relations. Program is not completed here. Uh, capture uh, all the uh, arsenal of tools from differential algebraic geometry, um, Lorentz transformation, and so forth, with, with which uh, modern relativistic physics work. And uh, in particular, build a, build a complete picture of physics, of the physical world, but with, a, with finitary means, without, without uh, uh, conceding any, anything on this, uh, on this point, without uh, proposing an approximation, but really a complete, continuous, but planetary picture. We will leave the, the realm of uh, physics right now. Uh, it, uh, it, is, uh, it is, in some sense, the historical backdrop, um, and uh, probably one of the motors of, of uh, um, of uh, success of, of petrinets and of uh, concurrency uh, uh, theory. It is grounded in, uh, in a very fundamental and in general um, principles. And I will show you some, um, some aspects of uh, the application of, uh, of techniques that use petrinets in uh, uh, engineering contexts, in particular telecommunication, and uh, sketch a little bit what we experience right now in, uh, in biology. So, uh, for those who are familiar with uh, veterinary techniques, you will uh, find again uh, uh, invariant calculus and uh, unfoldings. Uh, I will sketch them uh, as, as well as I can. Okay, you've already seen the token game. Uh, right now, let us look at a slightly bigger, bigger example and just uh, formalize a little bit more. The Petronet is a bipartite graph of places and transitions and uh, with a flow relation that connects them. And uh, uh, to this add a global state that is given by a marking that associates uh, numbers of tokens to, uh, to the different places. So right here uh, we have at most one uh, token in every in every place, and many places are empty. Uh, if you've taken some uh, computer science class, you may see a mutex algorithm here, but this is only for the initiated. So what can you do uh, with this? Well, um, you can do linear algebra. If you want to understand what the, what the behavior of this uh, system uh, uh, does, what properties uh, it satisfies, um, which is important for you if you are designing a system using it. Well, you can uh, uh, code the structure of this graph in an incidence matrix that has uh, zeros when there's no connection between a place and the transition, uh, minus one if the, uh, uh, if the arc consumes something. So here from P1 to T1, I consume a token uh, if a token is produced from T1 to P2, right here, uh, there is a plus one, and so forth. A nice uh, 
Uh, and what is 10 here? Sorry? What is 10 here? Is a misprint. As a misprint? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Shame on my head. Because because uh, I copied this from uh, another set of slides and I, I must have missed it already in the previous one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> it's nice to see that you're actually paying attention. It's really good. Thank you. Um, what do you do with this matrix? Well, um, you set it up in, a, in, a, in this uh, easy way. And uh, well, this, this matrix uh, tells you everything that uh, the system does to uh, a distribution of tokens on the on the net and in fact uh, what is true is the following um, uh, for any uh, collection of uh, vectors in the dimension of the number of places any any weight vector on the on the places uh, if you have uh, an action t uh, a firing of condition that transforms one marking into another, uh, then this, uh, uh, then the equality uh, uh, on the right hand side is satisfied. Um, the difference between the resulting products is exactly given by the uh, product of the weight on the transition with uh, your, with your weight fa factor x. And now this is this is interesting uh, because uh, this means that uh, some uh, vectors x will have uh, no change at all under a transition. And if this is true for all transitions, well, this means that this weight vector is an invariant of the system, some property of the net that never changes under the under the evolution of the of the system, and uh, it's called place invariant because you we're based on the, on uh, uh, places. And yes, yeah, so what does this mean? If you if you do the exercise, well, it takes a little longer. We'll do it here. If you uh, complete the exercise in, and compute the uh, place invariance for this uh, net here, it so happens that it corresponds to overlapping subnets, and what happens is you have one place invariant here. Symmetric one on the right hand side, T5, T6, T4. And then one in the middle that comprises exactly this square with a cross in it. And uh, if you spell out the uh, invariance equation with the initial marking, you see that uh, these equalities hold, and one, uh, the marking on P1 plus the, that on P2 plus that on P3 uh, has always the same value. In other words, the token here only runs in cycles, it's never multiplied, and it never disappears. You can tell me, well, I can see that. It's a little uh, less trivial to see this in the middle here, but we have also the same uh, uh, kind of property which is uh, expressed <coughs> down here. Uh, why can this be important? Well, this can be exactly what you expect from your system. And uh, in, the, in the classical application, uh, mutual exclusion, this is what you want. Uh, you want this to be a guard uh, that ensures that either this process here enters a critical section or the other, but never both at the same time. So uh, you've, uh, you've shown this by doing some linear algebra. You didn't even have to uh, explore all the possible states. You don't even know them now. You've, uh, you've taken a graph, translated it into a, uh, into a matrix, and uh, solving some equations gives you the re desired result. I can see the questions here. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me, uh, from, from, from the picture, that uh, there can be a situation when uh, the black dots are located, say, in P1 and in P3 simultaneously. I don't think so. <coughs> but, oh, uh, but why? Well, uh, uh, well, I didn't prepare the slides, so you just have to uh, follow me here. 
Uh, you can move uh, here, right. here. And then you have uh, uh, tokens on P2, P4. The firing of T2 empties those places and puts a token here. And that will be the only token in the left-hand part of the system. Uh, this has gone. In, or in order to fire this transition, you have to empty this place first. So there is no conservation of tokens. A firing may lead to two, two tokens becoming one and then ah. one becoming two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Well, it's, uh, it's a little bit like in chemistry. The, the tokens that come out have a different meaning from those that come in. Hmm. So if you, if you join hydrogen and, uh, and oxygen, you get water. And of course, then the molecule count is not the same anymore. Mm -hmm. Think of it in this way. OK, thanks. OK, uh, you, can, uh, you can grow the, the numbers and uh, markings and systems and, uh, for instance, model a, uh, a production system um, very schematically, but uh, still you may, be, uh, you may want to, to uh, ensure the same uh, kind of uh, properties. Um, this can be seen as a, as a view of a, of a car factory. You have a, a, some set of uh, prefabricated uh, um, kits, whatever, uh, that need to be uh, processed by some robots and machines. So every, every such item needs to be handled by one robot and by one machine. They, they have to match. And when they match, uh, the corresponding transitions fire. And uh, right here, the, the robot will be released. The machine will be engaged. And here the, the machine, machine is freed and uh, uh, another robot takes the finished item and process it further. Uh, if you look at, at this with the, with the eyes uh, uh, that you had on the previous example, you will see that there are again invariants. Uh, there's one for the machines that tells you that the number of machines uh, is always the same, only that sometimes some are active and the others are waiting. And uh, for the robots, even if the net is more complicated for the robots, uh, the same holds true. If you add these, 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 and this robot together, the sum will always be R, the, the one that you, that you started with. And uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, this will be the last slide where we uh, talk about these things. There's a huge uh, literature in uh, automatic uh, control with petri nets, where the petri nets are uh, used as uh, models of uh, plants, factories, and uh, you will use them to identify the points where you should uh, intervene to prevent something from happening or to force something to happen so that uh, your factory uh, stays in a set of good states. This is something like automatic control in, in uh, two sentences, it's not much meaningful, but uh, uh, I hope it gives you a slight idea of what's going on. Okay, we, we talked about uh, P invariants. The dual is also possible um, if you uh, take the matrix, uh, the incidence matrix, and, and uh, transpose it. And you can also solve the corresponding zero equation, and uh, the uh, solutions for that. Uh, are called T invariants. And these T invariants can correspond to uh, sequences of uh, transition firings that reproduce the initial state. So for this uh, example net here, you can compute the T invariants and you find that it corresponds to two subnets that you have on the right. The original net is the true of them fuse over some places and transitions. And uh, if, you, if you are in a position to, uh, to fire any of those uh, as many times as you like, you will always retrieve the same markings again and again and again, as long as you don't, you don't branch away. So we can uh, 
uh, do the same analysis, T invariance, P invariance for the same kind of net. If we do this uh, for T invariance here, then the, the decomposition uh, tells us which are the behaviors that reproduce the state, that iterate uh, on, the same, on the same state, that are typical processes for the system, for a factory that would be exactly interesting. And uh, it can give us hints, I'm very careful here, can give us hints about the liveness of the system, whether the system can always continue or, uh, or get blocked at some, some points. I'm not saying that you only have to look at the invariants, it's not true. But you have a, you have a first uh, idea for this. On the other hand, the p invariants that we had in the mutex example, you can compute them in this example as well. It gives you a decomposition that is not quite the same. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, finite automata, um, they, these uh, patronets are in some sense uh, uh, representations of finite automata. And uh, like we've seen, these invariants are able to express properties that all reachable states must always satisfy. For instance here, in each of these uh, invariants, there will always be exactly one token on different places, but never more, but never less. Um, if you're able to cover your entire system by such invariants, that means that it must be bounded. It means that it must be a bound of the number of tokens that can be in any, in any place. It's not possible otherwise. You may be able to decompose your system in such a way that you analyze smaller subsystems and understand them better. And uh, yes, once again, you may imagine that for uh, control, supervision, supervision of plants, uh, etc., uh, these uh, invariants uh, are very, uh, very handy. Uh, I'll come to, to uh, telecommunications in a moment. Just let me remind you here that uh, the subject is veterinates uh, and concurrency. And right here, we've uh, forgotten a little bit about concurrency. We've uh, done some global analysis of the entire system at once. Well, there are domains where you cannot really do this. And telecommunications is so one of uh, it's one of those. So these slides uh, don't don't require you to know anything about uh, uh, telecommunication engineering. I, I really assure you. Um, the problem is that telecommunication networks are very big, and very fast, and things happen all the time. If you have an optical network, for instance, then uh, information must be sent through lasers over, uh, over a glass fiber. And the glass may break, the laser may break, uh, the reception may fail, and so forth. And if that happens, you still see it directly. You want to infer that, the, that uh, such a problem has occurred from some other trace. And this is what you call fault diagnosis. Um, and uh, it uh, became very crucial uh, uh, some 10 or 15 years ago. So these pictures are actually taken from, a, from an actual uh, uh, research project with uh, France Telecom. Uh, so this is the canonical uh, symbolic representation of uh, an optical leak, uh, where uh, things can go wrong. Uh, Loss of signal is one of the typical problems if the, the laser on the other end of the uh, fiber goes down. Uh, TF uh, is a potential risk, total failure after non-reception of the signal. Now, the problem is that networks, even when they are localized, uh, uh, are very big. And even this, uh, this is very schematic. This is, uh, uh, the inscriptions are not uh, legible. Uh, these are four sites around Paris in which uh, uh, major switches uh, um, 
uh, are located. And in each uh, site, you have a hierarchy of interconnected uh, uh, elements that uh, react to one another and depend on one another uh, very heavily. Um, and they are, of course, connected among themselves by, by optical fibers. Now, what happens if something goes wrong? Where well, something goes wrong, it doesn't stay confined in one place. Okay? Let's say we have a total failure down here in Gentilly. This will bother the colleague in Mont Rouge, who will create bother all through the side of Mont Rouge. And then another failure for the, for the center at Mont Rouge will occur, which will bother Gentilly and uh, will escalate through the digital hierarchy and uh, bother uh, digital, uh, bother high uh, placed uh, elements in other sites. This is nice, we understand it. But the supervisor does not see any of the arcs. The supervisor only sees the dots. And now the problem is telecommunication networks are fast. So all these dots appear virtually simultaneously for any reasonable observer. So uh, it was not possible to continue like it was still on the 90s to have, a, to have a human supervisor looking at screens with uh, red and green lights popping up when things <coughs> were, were reported because uh, uh, there were too many of these signals they came too fast. So uh, you need, you need uh, a computer algorithm that is able to uh, do the correlation and the deduction of faults for you. And uh, you have to feed this algorithm by mathematical models. So this is where concurrency comes in, and this is where veterans will come in. So what happens here? Um, you have remote sites from which uh, sensors will inform a supervisor situated somewhere in the middle of the network. And uh, the supervisor will see the uh, streams of alarms uh, coming in. Well, this is very reminiscent of, uh, of physical space time. You have sites that are at a certain geographic distance from one another and uh, they are not able to, uh, to give a unique and uh, uniform timestamp to all their observations. Because uh, whatever happens here happens at the same speed with which they can transmit their alarms. So the supervisor here seeing something happening there, there, We'll not be able to tell which came first. So, uh, what can you do? Well, you, uh, you try to remember uh, what you know about concurrency and, uh, and that there are actually models that uh, allow you to, uh, to capture it. And for these models to, to be used, uh, you need to uh, do some abstractions. This is how the engineers had represented the uh, procedures that were triggered when a fault occurred. But that was much too much information. So we had to do away with a, a lot of this. Um, basically reduce the kind of information to uh, the type, well, we have a collection of preconditions that trigger some event, and this event triggers some alarm. Or maybe not. Well, the alarm uh, is what we represent in a Petronet uh, as uh, just a name, just an identifier on some transition. All the rest uh, was irrelevant for the problem or irrelevant for the uh, question of uh, alarm propagation, of uh, fault propagation, sorry. But all we retained was uh, the structure on the right which is, of course, a little passionate that you can compose with others. Well, remember this uh, 
a picture of uh, uh, the, the global system and its size. Um, what, what is the advantage uh, of uh, the Petronet on the right hand side uh, compared to an equivalent representation of the same process that's on the right? Well, the inscriptions are missing. Uh, the intention is to have a, a transition A here, 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 whenever you go on this diagonal, uh, C down here, and uh, B in this direction, or this, or that. So, uh, any, any process that can occur here, first A, then B, then C, or first A, then C, then B, etc., you can find it on the right hand side, and the big dots correspond to the global states of this. Well, the first problem is that without inscription or even with inscription, you don't understand much on the right hand side. The second, even bigger problem is that I could still draw this because there were just three transitions. What if there are 100? 100 copies of this might still fit. Two to the hundred. Uh, states. It's hopeless. I cannot draw them. Uh, I don't want to draw them. I don't want to, to block a memory space and so forth. So, uh, we, are, we are motivated to keep this nice concurrent compositional representation as long as possible and do our analysis with it because uh, we save time and we understand things better. And for this, uh, uh, battery nets are very handy, once again. Um, we set up uh, models that contain only transitions for uh, fault propagations. So everything else that happened in the network was not modeled at all, only the fact that uh, something went from OK to KO, or went back by repair to it. And then, of course, the connection between different components were explicited by, by Petronet arcs. And then, what is uh, handy with uh, Petronets is that you can use them to model the system, and you can model the observation also as a Petronet. The observation, what was that? Well, it's the, the chronicle of all the alarms that come into the supervisor. And uh, to make things simple, suppose that this is just a sequence uh, of labels beta, alpha, rho, rho, beta, alpha. We just put them in the sequence and we turn it into a petronet. Now what we want to do is use our model to extract the possible behaviors that are compatible with this observation. What can the Petronet do that would result in this sequence of labels? And uh, we don't have to explore all the sequences for that. We can do smarter. Uh, first of all, uh, I said that we would like to keep uh, concurrency as much as possible. Well, exactly. We don't uh, draw all the sequences. We don't interleave all the... Uh, all the possible combinations of, uh, uh, of transitions, but we uh, uh, draw a partially ordered structure of this sort by just keeping track of possible occurrences. This is the net in its initial state, we copy the initial state, and then for every transition, for every occurrence that is possible, we glue a, a copy of the transition with its environment to the <coughs> prefix that we already have. And in this way, we get a structure that grows with time, of course, and that uh, contains uh, uh, a representation of, uh, of possible behaviors of the system. So now we wanted to filter those behaviors that are compatible with the observation. So do we have to look uh, them up in here? No. We can do smarter than that. Because um, Petronets allow us to, uh, to
to synchronize, to add more uh, constraints on the same transition. So remember, this is the picture that you get if you have just the model of the plant. Now add the model of the observation and fuse those transitions that have the same name. So take this beta and marry it with the uh, betas from the, from the net. Uh, the labels are not uh, in here, but uh, uh, you, have, you have some here. Um, uh, the alphas come in over here, and uh, rows occur in different, uh, in different uh, positions and so forth. This gives you a slightly messier unfolding structure. But, yeah, why is it so messy? It is messy only because we, we have these additional spurious uh, artificial places from here. They were only there because we had drawn this uh, observation as a metronet. For our inference, we don't need those places anymore. And if we throw them out, we have a, we have a nice uh, structure on the right that contains all the uh, information uh, necessary, all the possible, uh, all the possible uh, executions of the system that are allowed by this. And then you have to push a little further and uh, you see that, uh, well, the parts in white are not possible because they explain only part of this here and do not go far enough down. Um, in the blue parts you have the right explanations, but you have to make a choice uh, between the two uh, instances of row, because up to here you only have one row, and so forth. So you still have to, to narrow down, you still have to do inference, but you do it on smaller and smaller uh, data sets. And uh, this, was, uh, this was possible because of the, the power and the the nice uh, surgery that you can do with uh, with metronets. Okay, uh, I think I have another ten minutes or so. Where's the, where's the usual schedule? Okay, so we had uh, talked about uh, we talked about physics. We've talked about uh, engineering. And I uh, already admit that on the last slide I will uh, uh, tell you that there's so many things that I have that I will never talk about and have not have time to talk about. Not even workflows, so I apologize to Irina that she would be in a better position than me to explain that. Uh, so now, uh, biology was not traditionally a field that, uh, that was attracted by uh, to Petri Nets and uh, uh, it's not a field where you would expect uh, concurrency because uh, living organisms are not usually spread over distances that create relativistic effects. And still, and still, uh, we have a, uh, we have an increasing need for uh, not just formal models uh, to to explain biological phenomena, uh, but also to deal with. Uh, huge networks of, uh, of manufacturers uh, acting independently of one another. So, uh, the, this uh, picture shows uh, uh, why biologists of today are uh, increasingly motivated to, uh, uh, to use formal mammals models because uh, they need to understand uh, which behaviors emerge from uh, uh, complexes of, of uh, regulation networks and, uh, and they need to test uh, their understanding of the, the system by putting their models to a test, uh, improving the models after the test and so forth. Mm -hmm. So some nice mathematical language is really, is really what is needed here. And uh, well, to pick one topic uh, the one of uh, 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 gene regulatory networks. So the, these are these are uh, formal abstractions for 
pre-abstractions in some ways of uh, the processes that uh, determine how uh, genes actually affect the, the life of the organism that they that they're supposed to determine. And remember that uh, that uh, genes are uh, at best something like uh, computer programs, code that you write, and then on runtime many things can happen, and uh, interactions with other systems uh, can influence the the result and so forth. It's a very crude analogy. I apologize. Um, so what happens is that uh, you have a, a great number of substances involved whose quantities are important to, uh, to see which uh, features uh, will be uh, suppressed, which features will be developed by the, herbal, by the organism. And uh, the, uh, when the, these uh, understandings were collected, um, starting in the 90s, if I am not mistaken, the conventional way was to do away with the quantitative information and uh, draw qualitative diagrams like uh, these, with just pluses and minuses between, uh, uh, on the arcs between two, two substances, meaning that the presence of A favors uh, an increased production of C or the presence of C uh, uh, diminishes the production of E, and so which is nice if you look at two or three such uh, substances. But uh, if you ask me, what is the precise impact of uh, A on D? It is not possible to say in this because uh, uh, you lose qualitative information, and the qualitative information does not uh, take you far enough. So, uh, what is, uh, what is uh, currently happening is uh, the, uh, the observation uh, that, uh, that such a, uh, such a uh, positive-negative uh, modeling is uh, nicely abstract, but probably too abstract. Uh, you see here uh, the number of uh, components that you can have uh, this example is ridiculous compared to uh, compared to the uh, networks that uh, biologists today have to look at or not even look at. They are happy if they can store it somewhere in the computer. Right. Now, what if we do this in a slightly more uh, in a slightly richer way? Instead of just uh, stating that there is a substance A, let's say that the substance can be present in one, in two or more levels. It can be absent, present, strongly present, and so forth. And then every substance becomes a little uh, finite state automaton that uh, moves from one state to another according to, uh, to influences from, uh, from outside. And uh, we can keep the memory of uh, what happened to, uh, to the substance in the system. So uh, let's suppose we start with something like this. Uh, and uh, some action lambda 1 occurs. Then uh, most uh, substances are not concerned. But, but 1 changes state. And then Moving on, you uh, you keep uh, you keep track of uh, what has happened uh, in other parts of the uh, of the system, and uh, you can uh, start asking uh, you can start asking questions uh, once you've uh, started uh, this. Is uh, is a state reachable where the substance E is actually present? And here we're talking about uh, things that can be. Uh, important for the life of the organism or dangerous for the life of the organism. So um, these are not purely academic questions, right? So there, there's some uh, uh, there's some need uh, um, behind uh, behind this. And uh, I cannot say that we have today really uh, the algorithms 
to solve this. Uh, there are many uh, algorithms dealing with these uh, systems uh, in an approximative way. So you find some behaviors, uh, maybe not all of them. Sometimes you get too pessimistic and you see dangers everywhere, even if, the, if that such a process is not even possible. And uh, what, uh, what we are arguing and what we are starting to do in, in, uh, in Paris is uh, to say that, well, if you use petri nets, you can be exact. You can, uh, uh, if, you, if you're smart enough, you will be able to have the, the exact information of, uh, and uh, not only this, I remember that one of the first slides I showed you, uh, I talked about chemistry here, and chemistry and petri nets uh, are uh, close friends. It's also been uh, uh, observed by biologists and uh, computer scientists, this is taken from uh, from a tutorial by the group of Monika Heiner in, in Cottbus, uh, where the uh, enzymatic reaction, uh, where some, uh, some substance is present in blue, an enzyme uh, activates a react reaction that uh, produces uh, some uh, output substance, some product from this uh, substance, and this is really what you can say with uh, the pattern of transition. With a slide extended from what we said, because we want, you want to express the enzyme in such a way that it, that it is just present, but does not consumed itself in the, uh, in the reaction. But uh, uh, whenever you stumble upon contextual nets, uh, these extensions exist and they're increasingly well understood. And also, uh, using petri nets, uh, makes, it gives you some, some sort of uh, collection of legal bricks that you can put together to, uh, to create new meaning. Um, uh, you can uh, have this uh, enzymatic reaction with some uh, gene expression that provides your enzyme, for instance, or that uh, removes the enzyme and therefore stops the re reaction from continuing and uh, you can integrate uh, the, uh, the elements in, uh, in larger networks um, uh, moving upward uh, from, from, uh, to do greater structure. And uh, just to show a little bit what, what we have uh, uh, achieved as a, as a first application, uh, uh, we are looking at the problem of uh, computing attractors in such uh, regulatory networks. What are attractors? Uh, well, uh, you, you may know that, uh, for instance, the, the cells of the human body uh, all have the same genetic curve, but not all of them have the same shape or function or role in the body. And uh, in some circumstances, for instance, if you are hurt, uh, cells can change their role and uh, differentiate into, into different roles. This is how skin gets repaired after, after you get hurt, for instance. And uh, if you have a graphical representation of all the states that the organism can have, that the cell can have, well, this corresponds to a terminal uh, strongly connected component of that graph where you where you always turn around. And uh, computing these attractors, of course, tells you a lot, a lot about the possibilities of some organism. So it sounds like a wonderful news, but uh, computing them is so hard that it doesn't mean that we have uh, biology already in a, on the computer. No, it's not the case. Um, for every case where we have this, <coughs> We know uh, uh, that there is some particular stable state of a cell, for instance, after uh, differentiation or de-differentiation, uh, what are the mutations that are reachable from the current state. Uh, and from that you will want to uh, go further, because behind biology there is medicine. Uh, if, you, if you know 
what kind of mutation, what kind of growth change is possible. Maybe you want to do something about it. Maybe you want to block it. Maybe you want to encourage it. You want maybe to encourage the uh, regenerative power of an organism, or you want to prevent cancer if you can. So uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense, I think, to uh, uh, go uh, and, uh, and model these, uh, these networks and uh, propose uh, algorithms for precise predictions and control of, uh, of these biological processes. We've done this in a very uh, small and uh, sketchy way. Uh, so if you, if you represent uh, a small regulatory network by this small petri net, well, if you look for attractors in the natural, uh, immediate way, you compute the state graph, what are the markings that you can reach, and uh, then you will find that there are two uh, attractors here. One is up here. Once the system ends up here, it will never leave that state. And the other is rotating at the bottom. Okay, if you have this graph, you can find it by graph traversal algorithms and so forth. Just uh, remember that you're dealing with something of the size of 2 to the power of, and, uh, and then you have something like 10,000 uh, in the experiment. It's pretty hopeless. Whereas, if you compute the unfolding, the same beast that we used for the, for the uh, fault diagnosis in telecom, uh, well, the same system has a structure in which you can uh, see not only all the states, but even all the behaviors. What we can do here is uh, identify the, uh, the um, processes that are possible to iterate on the system, which is exactly what attractors do. They uh, return to, uh, to the same state and never leave a, a certain class of states. And uh, from the unfolding procedure, we have uh, immediately two attractors with their internal dynamics. Well, there's not much dynamics in the, in the second one, of course. But this one came out as, a, uh, as, the, uh, as the direct result of, uh, of the internet uh, construction with the information that uh, after this event, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, start again. This is very recent work. Exploitation of this uh, is still to be done, but uh, there's potential. And there's, uh, there's actually a wealth of, of uh, real important questions that are, that are waiting for us. So, uh, just some leads of uh, what uh, petrinets could be able to, to do in biology. Accelerate the search of attractors and find cut sets. Um, cut sets meaning um, sets of uh, factors or events that are necessary in order to reach a certain part of the system. So that means identifying what is the factor that influences your health in a good or a bad fashion, or what would be the drug that helps against this mutation, etc., etc., etc. So if you know cut sets, you know a lot of how you can influence a biological network. Um, so you have a, you have a lot of questions we, we are uh, trying to, to uh, get a project uh, on uh, cell reprogramming, which basically puts, puts, puts the two together, understand what are the possible attractors and how do you move from one to the other to reprogram the cell. And uh, uh, mentioned, uh, for instance, the work by Monika Heimer and her colleagues um, uh, using invariance, using uh, compositionality in uh, analyzing regulatory networks. Let's not forget that uh, uh, synthetic biologists are starting to, to build up uh, 
genetic circuits from, from small elements, very much in the same way that, that we are used to gluing factory nets together. So if we know something, how to <coughs> verify and test properties from uh, legal bricks to their composition and so forth, they'll be happy to use it. Of course, control, monitoring, and so forth. I would just have to stop here because the list uh, might get too long. Okay. Thank you very much for being with me until this point. Let me just resume the things that I did say today. I hope I convinced you that uh, the PetroNet as a model and the phenomenon of uh, concurrency are both meaningful in a strong sense that correspond to something real in physics, in engineering, of course in chemistry, and increasingly in biology. It's not just, not just paperwork. Uh, the uh, concurrency is, a, is an inherent property of systems. It's also intuitive. Uh, remember that sometimes representing concurrency as such tells you more of a system than gluing everything together. And uh, uh, contrary to uh, common prejudice, you can actually use uh, concurrency to help you save time and analysis. What I didn't say is that there's a lot more of models to be looked at, a lot more of uh, um, uh, analysis methods, um, a lot more applications. And uh, these are only those ones that I thought of when writing these slides, but I certainly forgot things. Um, uh, I'm indebted to a number of references that I will show you on the next slides. And uh, uh, what I have to say to you is a big thanks for uh, inviting me and for following me here. Thank you. I even have a question, uh, which I had from the beginning, but it's more appropriate for the end of the talk, uh, which is uh, when you uh, made this remark that uh, uh, Petri himself said that um, uh, these, these are finitary models of continuous yes. uh, subjects. Uh, so uh, could you um, say a few words on um, the uh, temporal dynamics. I mean, uh, so the temporal dynamics. yes, yes. I, I understand that uh, uh, there are combinatorial rules of uh, firings and of mm. contents, but uh, how uh, how is this mapped on the timeline? Yeah, this is actually uh, when Patrick was alive. This was a this was a recurrent subject of debate when he came to mm -hmm. when he came to University. Uh, because he, he was uh, strictly opposed to uh, any attempt of, of including real time uh -huh. uh, in the models. Um, there's, a, there's a big literature on the Petri nets where the fact that transitions take time is explicitly modeled, uh, or where uh, transitions uh, have temporal constraints, and uh, uh, so we have. Uh, have uh, semantics that you best express as, uh, as time automata with, uh, um, with durations and, and um, uh, time inversions and so forth. Um, the temporal progression in a very canonical, mm -hmm. Petri like uh, interpretation would have to be uh, the inclusion in the net of some uh, explicit oscillator process that uh, corresponds to the uh, cesium in a, uh, an automatic uh, clock, for instance, that uh, uh, that you have as, as one uh, active process and that, that sets the pace. And uh, the uh, timeline, uh, in quotation marks, um, arises from the fact that particular clock ticks synchronize with particular other events. So, uh, I could think it's uh, complicated to, uh, to do this, but uh, 
Let's say one. Whether uh, I mean, uh, this uh, this is to say uh, a language to describe the current systems, but uh, probably not the only one. Probably, I mean, the, there is a, a paradigm of finite automata. Uh, can uh, these different paradigms be translated into one another? I mean, uh, 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 an example that I'm having in mind is that uh, in, in, in theory of computing, there are several uh, fundamental models of computation mm -hmm. which are uh, equivalent, and, uh, that's, uh, and that, 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 uh, that's a theorem. You can prove that uh, you can express Turing, mach Turing machine in terms of Markov algorithms, for example. Now, uh, here, uh, this is not the only approach to concurrency which is conceivable. Uh, the, the pitfall in questions like this is uh, in the notion of equivalence. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, for an abundance of computation, you had a very predefined uh, notion of equivalence. And uh, the same also holds true for, uh, for models of, of concurrent systems. Mm -hmm. um, you can describe any uh, any concurrent system also by a transition system which is an automata that may not be finite and uh, and then you have other uh, dis other descriptions more semantical like process algebras and, and so forth and uh, let me put it this way uh, for every for every uh, translation you can uh, provide a good uh, justification in stating what exactly is the equivalence relation that is satisfied by the two, by the two points of the, the translation. Uh, we, to, just to cite one example, um, we, I, I mentioned this, uh, this decomposition into, uh, into uh, uh, P uh, invariants of a system that uh, can be seen as, uh, as fine automata, each one in itself. So basically, you end up uh, uh, representing a complex patronet as a collection of uh, automata that synchronize at times. Mm -hmm. Add time to this, and this gets uh, more complicated. You have time automata that, uh, that synchronize and, and so forth. And uh, we ended up uh, showing that, that the translation that we give is the right one. Uh, but in terms of an equivalence relation that uh, uh, takes into account not only the, uh, the interleaved behaviors, but also some other property of the events, particularly the locality. Mm -hmm. What is the component that the event belongs to? Is that respected by the, by the system that we translated into? So, uh, so what happens there is not just, it's not just technical. Of course, I want to defend ourselves, but I don't want to say that we were cheating. We were not cheating because it's, uh, it's an actual information uh, being realized in a sequential local way or being realized in, uh, in a distributed way of the remote sites is not the same thing. Uh, and uh, if you look at equivalence purely from a temporal way, uh, that interleaving and concurrency make no difference. If you take space into account, the picture is entirely different. Mm -hmm. This is a very partial answer, but mm -hmm. I would still mm -hmm. think in these directions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let's take a seat.
of you who are interested in specialness in different sectors are welcome to our board. Uh, one last announcement is that, um, as, uh, as I said last week, this seminar is supposed to uh, be held twice a month, normally at second and fourth Thursdays of each month, and uh, the next one will be on October 9th of October, uh, and the speaker will be the Freddy who will be uh, explaining what multiplicality, uh, I mean, what every computer scientist should know about multiplicality. Nice. So in three weeks. Right? Uh, yes.